Greetings, church. I'm Susan Boyer, senior pastor of the Laverne Church of the Brethren, and I am so delighted to be able to join you in this worship service. Before we jump into worship, let us acknowledge that the land on which our church building sits is the traditional land of the Gabrielino people, past and present. We honor this land and the people who called this home and suffered under Spanish colonization. We must acknowledge the pain and history that made us landowners. As we gather to worship, let us commit to honoring this land and its people. I have a couple announcements for you. We are having our second outdoor in-person Vesper service today, June 27th at 5 p.m. Registration was required, but if you did not do that, you can still join us on July 25th or August 29th when we will join for in-person Vespers again. This past week, I offered an inquirer's class for anyone interested in learning more about the Laverne Church of the Brethren. Unfortunately, we had the wrong Zoom link up on our website, and I have no way of knowing if any of you tried to join and were frustrated. If that happened, I am truly sorry. The correct Zoom link is now up on our website and I hope you join us this coming Tuesday at 4 p.m. Pacific time. If you haven't yet signed up for Peace Camp for children, kindergarten through sixth grade, this is just a reminder that you can do that right off of our website at lavernecob.org. This week you will receive our monthly email. If you don't receive our monthly email, you can subscribe to it right off of our homepage. Be looking for that email. It's filled with information and opportunities for the month of July. We're pleased to announce that as well as accepting your financial offerings via PayPal, we can now accept money through Zelle. You do this through your own online banking. There is more information about that on our homepage at lavernecob.org. Thank you for keeping the ministry of this church alive in whatever way it is that you have chosen to contribute. We are really grateful. I want to tell you a little bit about today's service. In this worship, we are kicking off a sermon series called Dangerous Preaching. This series grows out of a book study that we did back in May of Drew Hart's book, Who Will Be a Witness? I was in a breakout group in that book study considering the idea of dangerous preaching, and I heard in that discussion a desire for more bravery in our preaching. So you asked for it, and here it is. Today's sermon will address reparations, and I ask that you consider how we might be about the work of repairing the economic injustice of our history within our own family histories and that of our community and church and nation. Also in this service, you will see a video. Each year, the Peace and Justice Commission facilitates an essay writing contest for high school students. We named this award after Doris and Benton Rhodes, former members of this church who were peacemakers among us. Members of this congregation evaluated the submissions and chose 11 winners. Phil Hofer met with the student whose entry was awarded the most money, Khadija Abdul Aziz. Phil visited her and her mother and grandfather in their home in San Dimas. And in just a moment, you will see a video in which Khadija tells about her essay and her hopes for the future of our country. If you'd like to make a contribution to help us continue the Peacemaker Award in the future, you can do that by clicking on the PayPal button on our homepage and designating it for the Rhodes Peace Scholarship. Now, let us worship together as brave people with open hearts, eager to be about the work of repairing injury. My name is Khadija Aziz. I live in San Dimas, California. I go to City of Knowledge School and I will be graduating in the year of 2023. Our English teacher and our principal 
wanted us to be a part of something and they found the topic um, to be like really important so uh, they wanted us to write essays and be a part of the competition. And you wrote your essay and it was among a number of essays that were submitted. You were awarded a financial reward for your writing and I want to congratulate you, Thank you. on that. Uh, so I wrote about um, the importance of talking about racial and social injustices in America. And then I also talked about um, something that my sister uh, started, which is a magazine, and I helped her do that. Uh, that uh, It's called Voices of the Unheard, so it addresses issues that aren't talked about a lot um, and about you know people that are oppressed around the world and not just in the U.S., but the things that were happening in the U.S. opened their eyes to it. So in the last magazine, we talked about um, women of color struggles throughout the years. And one of the articles that kind of stood out to me was um, about racism in the feminist movement and how certain women are discriminated against even in the fight for, you know, the fight against misogyny and sexism. I am not. It's not. more of writing is something that my sister kind of took on, and, but it's I did want to, you know, help out and so I edit the magazine. I would like to go into the medical field because I've always found it like, to be really important to help people in that way. I don't as of right now, but I I'm not sure. I mean, I'm open to a lot of possibilities. Lot of there are a lot of different struggles for different things, um, like human rights movements and all of that. And so, like, in the center of all of that is peace. So if people are able to resolve their problems at things as big as, like, racism, I think we can get peace from that. But I also think that it takes a lot, and so that's something that I wrote about in my essay. Now, I think my biggest concern would have to do with racial justice. Um, it's one of the biggest problems in this country, so um, I hope that, uh, you know, issues that have to do with that are kind of resolved in the future. And I have no doubt you will be part of that. You're getting started now in school, and I commend you for that. Thank you. Not only for the essay writing you did, but also for the magazine you publish. Well done, and best regards as you finish this academic year. Thank you. family. It's Amanda here with Children's Time. Today, Pastor Susan is going to talk about reparations. And that might be a word that's new to you. The definition for reparations in the dictionary is this, the making of amends for a wrong one has done by paying money to or helping those who have been wronged. Whoosh. That is a really long definition, kind of confusing. But you could also think of reparations like another word that it sounds like, repair. Reparations, repair. Reparations, repair. So it's like if you break one of your friend's toys, saying sorry isn't quite enough. You would wanna to try to fix the toy or replace it. Reparations seek to make things right when someone has been wrong. You could also think of it like this example. You're in class and there's two students 
and they get a fresh box of crayons and a blank sheet of paper. And day after day, one of the kids, we can call her Carrie, keeps getting her crayons taken away by another student. Let's call the other student who's taking the crayons Beth. So day after day this happens, Carrie's crayons are taken by Beth, and Carrie tells the teacher, this isn't fair, but the teacher just shrugs and looks the other way. And Carrie tells Beth, hey, these are my crayons, don't take them, give them back. And Beth just ignores her. Some days Carrie is just so sad and tired that she doesn't say anything at all. And after about a month, Carrie has only one green crayon left, and Beth, on the other hand, she has so many crayons, she doesn't even have room for all of them. Then their teacher assigns an activity. The teacher says that the class needs to draw the most colorful sunset ever. Carrie only has one single green crayon, and Beth has every color in the rainbow, and even doubles. Does that sound right? I don't think so either. So reparations would be some way to repair this situation. And there are a lot of ways this could be done. Mm, Beth could give all the crayons back to Carrie. But then what about all those days she didn't have crayons and they were taken from her? That doesn't seem right. Mm. Or the teacher could give Carrie a fresh new pack of crayons. Another student in the class could give Carrie a whole new art set. There's lots of ways the teachers and students in this class could make this situation right. And I bet you could think of other ideas that would repair the situation. In our world, many people have been treated unfairly for years. And our world is broken and it's in need of repair. One thing I know about Jesus is that Jesus seeks to repair the broken, to make things right. So I hope that we can be like Jesus and help repair the broken parts of our world. Hello, my name is Alex and I will be reading Mark chapter 10 verses 17 to 25. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Thank you. I love the prayer attributed to St. Francis that begins, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. But I recently came upon an adaptation of that prayer that I think profoundly speaks into the times we're now living. And so I share this adaptation with you today as prayer and also a call to loving action. Lord, make me a channel of your disturbance. Where there is apathy, let me provoke. Where there is silence, may I be a voice. Where there is too much comfort and too little action, grant disruption. Where there are doors closed and hearts locked, grant me the willingness to listen. When tradition speaks louder than need, grant me the willingness to listen. Disturb us, O oh Lord. Teach us to be radical. Grant that I may seek rather to do justice than to talk about it, to be with as well as for the poor, to love the unlovable as well as the lovely, 
to touch the passion of Jesus in the pain of those we meet. To accept the responsibility to be church. Lord, make me a channel of your disturbance. Amen. I'm Linda Rodriguez Knowles, and I'm going to read Luke 19, 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to a place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw began to grumble and say, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay them back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. Thank you. A man ran up to Jesus. That's the way the story begins in Mark, the one that Alex read this morning. We aren't told this man's name, his age, his occupation, his marital or economic status. We don't know if he likes Jesus or has a dagger hidden behind his back. We don't know. But Jesus can see the man. He can see that he's wealthy. Jesus can see what we, the reader, can't see. The man kneels down at Jesus' feet. In every other story in the Gospel of Mark, when someone kneels down at the feet of Jesus, they're asking to be healed. Good teacher, the man says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Don't call me good, Jesus says. God alone is good. Eternal life has nothing to do with being good. It's the gift of our good God. So I assume you know the commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't defraud. Honor your father and mother. Jesus doesn't name all ten of the commandments. Just the ones that have to do with one's relationship with other human beings. And did you notice that one of them is different? Instead of saying, thou shalt not covet, Jesus says, don't defraud. Jesus gives the commandment some nuance. 
Why tell this rich man not to covet when he already has all the best things? Jesus has a different message for the wealthy. In a world of economic injustice, defrauding others brings one unfair economic gain. Jesus is addressing the economic divide that exists at his time, and unfortunately in our time. If fraudulent practices have brought this man financial gain, he is simply unaware of it. He is sure that what makes him wealthy was achieved by legitimate means. He believes that he has participated in a meritocracy, that he and his family have gotten where they are because of hard work. And those who aren't blessed like he and his family simply haven't worked hard enough. He has followed the rules of the economic system and benefited from it, unaware that the rules of the system were created in his favor. The man simply can't see his privilege. I've been following all those commandments since my youth, the man says with all earnestness. It tells us that Jesus looks at this man, privileged sincerity and his eyes fill with love for him. I'm constantly amazed at the way Jesus loves, even those who fail to see what he's telling them. Jesus says, there's something still you must do. What is it? He asks eagerly. Sell everything you have, give the money to the poor, and then come and follow me. Jesus doesn't say, go make a substantial gift to the synagogue and then you got yourself your ticket. He doesn't say, sell everything and just give the money away. He isn't just asking the man to unburden himself of his money. He is asking him to make reparations. We've been hearing that word quite a bit lately, but it, it isn't anything new. Jesus invited people to make reparations as part of their discipleship. If you want to be part of God's kingdom, Jesus says, then make reparations. The rich man kneeling at Jesus' feet came to Jesus in hopes of getting the one thing he doesn't yet have. And he's used to getting what he wants. How does he get his ticket to the kingdom of heaven? Jesus' answer is not what he expected. The author of the Gospel of Mark tells us that the man was shocked and that he left grieving because he would have so much to sell. The biblical writers don't often focus on someone's emotional response, so when it does, sit up, take notice. Jesus tells the rich man that there's only one thing he needs to do, and he decides that the cost is too great. He chooses the world, and he forfeits his soul. In the other story we heard today, Jesus is on another journey, passing through Jericho. When he looks up into a tree, and see Zacchaeus perched there. Zacchaeus was a Jew who had made a financial deal with the Roman occupation to collect the taxes of his Jewish neighbors. He wasn't breaking any laws that we know about. He was following the unjust law that required Jews to pay taxes to Rome for the privilege of being occupied. When we tell the story of Zacchaeus, we often focus on the part where Jesus spots him in the tree and invites himself to Zacchaeus' house for lunch. We teach our children the song about Zacchaeus. Do you know the one I'm talking about? Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. It ends with Jesus saying, Zacchaeus, you come down from there. For I'm going to your house today, for I'm going to your house today. That isn't the culmination of this biblical story. The song we teach our children leaves off the most important part. After spending time with Jesus, Zacchaeus realizes that his journey of redemption will require him to make reparations. Zacchaeus knows he has repair work to do. And he declares, I will give away half of all I own to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone, I will pay them back four times what I stole. Zacchaeus knows that he hasn't done anything any other tax collector would do, but 
he now sees that he's participated in a system that has benefited him while harming others. Zacchaeus does what the rich young man wouldn't. Jesus says today, today, salvation has come to this house because Zacchaeus is making reparations. Back in May, Dr. Drew Hart came to us via Zoom for a Q&A around his newest book, Who Will Be a Witness? When we asked him what would be some good next steps for the Laverne Church of the Brethren on this journey towards racial justice, he suggested that we might want to do a race and place study of our church, our church history, and also a study within our individual family histories. To address racism, we also need to look at our geographical histories. Most communities are segregated around racial lines. Why? There are many factors that have kept classism and racism alive in our culture. Slavery was replaced with black codes, which were replaced with vagrancy laws that increased the number of convicts. Convict leasing became a reality allowing private citizens to contract for cheap labor that convicts were required to do, another form of slave labor. Jim Crow, segregation, redlining, the burning of Black Wall Street, housing restrictive covenants, redlining, other forms of systemic racism in real estate, employment, and financial institutions, the preschool to prison pipeline, poor access to health care and higher education, just to name a few, have ensured white wealth in America. The impact of racism and slavery is so deep in our country, and we have not come to terms with the dehumanization that is built into our historical reality. After Dr. Hart suggested we look at how race and place has impacted who the Laverne Church of the Brethren is today, the Envisioning Commission began working on a plan to research the history of San Gabriel Valley and how this church may have benefited from, from our history as a predominantly white church. We've asked our summer service workers this year to help us by doing some additional research about the native peoples who lived on this land we now claim as our church home, as well as to look at the history of segregation in the city of Laverne. But Dr. Hart's challenge wasn't just to us as a, a church institution, but to also take on this challenge in our own individual family histories. How have you and I and or our families benefited or been harmed by white dominant culture? I know that the suggestion of reparations mystifies and frightens many of those of us who identify as white. That's why this series is called Dangerous Preaching. White folks need to be brave, brave Christians in the journey towards addressing racial injustice. I have heard people argue that slavery ended in 1865, and so why are we discussing this now? I know it's scary for those of us for whom a true and honest study of race and place means we would have to rewrite our autobiographies. No longer can we believe that we got where we are today solely by our own hard work and ingenuity. I understand that this is a complicated issue, but difficulty is never an excuse for refusing to do the important work of justice. As we step into it, we can learn from others. There are examples of churches and denominations across our country that are acknowledging that the privileges they now enjoy were gained on the backs of slavery and the colonization of others. The Episcopal Diocese of Texas has acknowledged that its first bishop was a slaveholder. St. James Episcopal Church of New York City erected a plaque on their building acknowledging that their church was made possible by wealth that resulted from slavery. The Minnesota Council of Churches is launching a first-of-its-kind Truth and Reparations Initiative modeled after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. 
It's a 10-year initiative involving 25 different denominations and acknowledges the harm done to black Americans and indigenous people, uniting the injustices done to both of those peoples rather than pitting them against each other. They recognize the absolute importance of truth-telling and the hearing of stories to the healing of racial injustice in our country. Reparations have been made in our history as a nation. In 1988, President Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act, which granted reparations to each surviving Japanese American who had been imprisoned during World War II. We think of reparations solely as a financial equation, but it's too narrow. Reparations is the righting of wrongs. Jesus himself is calling us to this work. Jesus talked to the rich young ruler and Zacchaeus about it back in the first century of the Common Era, but Jesus didn't come up with the idea. God's call for a jubilee year was about reparations, knowing that the social fabric has a way of tearing and becoming unjust. God asked the people to make reparations every seven years instead of failing to make reparations for over 400 years. As it turns out, making reparations is a spiritual issue. We are at the very beginning stage here at the Laverne Church of the Brethren of re-looking at our history and how we tell it. This is an invitation to us to follow the example of Zacchaeus and not the rich young ruler, an invitation to stand up like Zacchaeus and take a good hard look at ourselves and how we got to where we are. Zacchaeus resolved to repair the harm that benefited him at the expense and oppression and subjugation of others. Zacchaeus understood that he could no longer protect the system of the empire that oppressed some. In order for him to be reconciled to God, Zacchaeus had to repair his relationship with his neighbors. And when he made reparations, Jesus declared Zacchaeus, you are a child of Abraham and Sarah, and today, today, salvation has come to your house. What I know about you, church family, is that you've been brave before. You've stood up for justice in the past. Those of you with privilege have challenged your assumptions and done your work. Those of you who have suffered oppression have spoken your truth and trusted this church family with your stories. We are more whole because of these past journeys, and it's time to stretch those courage muscles again and declare ourselves ready to make things right, to mend the social fabric. What we need for this work of truth and reparations is here. What we need is here. We just need to commit ourselves once again to the work of justice. Amen.
Jesus calls us to be people of justice and connection. Jesus calls us to the work of repairing the breach. Jesus calls us in love and says, what you need is here. It's time to begin. Amen.